a lot of our clients have collectibles. You may have art, you may have inherited something from grandma or grandpa, and it's, you know, a painting of great grandpa painted by some famous artist. Maybe not, who knows, but, um, are, have you dealt with these in your estate plan? So that's really what our focus is, is, is the estate planning uh, context. And this, this covers painting, sculpture, uh, furniture, tangible things, carpet, silver, uh, coin stamps, furs, jewelry, all these tangible items that you can kind of pick up or that can sprout legs and walk away themselves, which is what lawyers euphemistically refer to as people taking things from an estate <laughs> sprouting legs, right? Uh, are you going to inherit any of these? You know, a lot of times these are overlooked assets that can have significant value or not. And so we're going to cover the or not as well. And not addressing these in your estate planning documents and can lead to kind of hurt feelings. We're coming up on, on Thanksgiving. We're doing this in the month of November. You know, many times families have a dispute and they never get together again for Thanksgiving. So we're going to talk about uh, a lot of these. If you're watching this on YouTube, we're doing this live, but if you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the bell and you'll be alerted when our content is released. Typically that's about 6 p.m. on Thursdays Pacific time. Hi, this is Jim Cunningham. We're going to talk about fine art, antiques, and collectibles in estates. And I have with me Andrea Roth and Lisa Hickey, and we will be covering all things fine art, antiques uh, when it comes to trust in estates. I'm Jim Cunningham. I'm a partner at Cunningham Legal. I have over 25 years experience. We have offices throughout the state of California. I'm a certified specialist in estate planning, trust, and probate law, which means I've taken another bar exam in addition to the normal California bar exam to become a certified specialist. I'm a real estate broker, securities and insurance licensed, and a pilot. These are currently the lawyers in our firm. We handle all things estate planning, trusts for typically uh, the mass affluent of California and other states as well. So if you're watching this in another state, we do work with clients uh, in other states as well. Some of our attorneys are licensed in these other states. And we have Andrea Roth. She's the founder and CEO of Roth Art Group. She has 30 years experience in the art field, and she specializes in European and American painting, sculpture, and photography. She's an accredited senior appraiser with the ASA since 2004, which is the association. Awesome. What does ASA stand for? American Society of Appraisers. There you go. PhD <laughs> in art history. And didn't you teach at UC Davis, right? Very Yes, good memory. I did UC right. Davis and at Santa Clara University. And you were a Fulbright scholar in Italy as a graduate student. I forgot that. Mm -hmm. Buongiorno, Andrea. Buongiorno. <laughs> and you currently serve on the board of directors of the St. Mary's College Art Museum. And we have uh, Lisa Hickey with us, 15 years experience in the field, and she specializes in decorative arts. Now, this is going to be stuff. Decorative arts are, are things like furniture and, and silverware, ceramics, glass, and other functional artwork. So these are things that you might use in daily life as opposed to hanging on a wall. Master's in art history from Christie's Education London and a member of the American so Society of Appraisers, Northern California Chapters, Board of Directors since 2016. And we have you have a team here, a whole team. You're based in Northern California and you're a full service uh, appraisal and collection management firm. So this is another issue. There's the uh, stuff in your house, but if you have too much stuff to fit in your house, or you might've sold that house and you know you don't have a place for it, a lot of times uh, art is stored. So this is something else we're gonna talk about and some do's and don'ts there. So I will turn it over to the capable uh, team of Andrea and Lisa, and let's start about what is an appraisal? What on earth are we talking about? Well, thanks, Jim, for such a nice introduction. And, and I wanted to clarify also that we are we do cover Southern California and nationwide as well. So two of our team members are actually based in Southern California. So we are able to have a nice wide reach and serve our clients um, throughout throughout the country. Um, so an appraisal, it's great. It's a excellent point of starting here because um, there's what somebody bought something for, and then there's an appraisal, right? And so basically, what is it worth? Just because you paid $10,000 for that ring or that painting doesn't mean that's what it's worth. So the way that we develop our appraisals is they are a development of an opinion of value based on facts and based on market data. First question we ask is what the what's the purpose of the appraisal? Yeah. What do you need to know for, right? Because there are different, <laughs> value, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, different value definitions for different purposes. 
So, I mean, things that get appraisals are things that don't have a readily, don't have a market value. Even stocks in, in the estate context, when a person passes away and you file an estate tax return, stocks are valued. It's not necessarily what the stock closed for in a certain day. So there's a different method of valuing a stock. Obviously, real mm -hmm. estate's done by a professional appraisal. And um, by the way, if you have a large estate, so if you have a, um, you know, in the millions and you file a, 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 a death tax return of form 706 and list, you know, $10,000 personal property, that's a red flag. You know, if you have a $20 million estate and 10,000 in personal property, I think that's a red flag. And, mm -hmm. and this is why it's important to appraise this is because you don't want to have these red flags in the estate context. So what is uh, an appraisal versus an advisory? So um, what we're going to talk about as we go through the materials, just as a, as a um, um, sort of a, a preview People get appraisals for different reasons. You might get an appraisal for insurance purposes. You might get an appraisal for a divorce, a bankruptcy. Maybe you're splitting up an estate. So different appraisals are for different purposes. So maybe if you can unpack what an advisory versus an appraisal is. Right. Well, so an advisory is, you know, people want to know, what do I do with this stuff that I just didn't hear? And we are able to give people some guidance. First of all, we'll do an inventory and figure out exactly what they have. And then we'll figure out what's actually worth appraising. And um, a lot of it has to do with what do they want to do with it? Do they like the stuff that they inherited? Are they interested in keeping it or do they want to sell it? Sometimes getting it out of the estate makes more sense. And how do we get out of the estate? Do we sell it or do we donate it? If we sell it, then there might be capital gains that we have to think about. So that may not always be the best solution. So we really like to kind of to partner in with our clients, um, legal and insurance advisors to make those smart decisions. And those smart decisions start with knowing what you have. So it's incredible how many people actually have no idea what they've inherited and even seasoned collectors don't know what their current values are, current market values are of their things that they purchased. You know, as you're talking, I'm thinking, you know, I I live in a neighborhood that has um, a, a mature neighborhood, I guess I could put it this way, lots of old people <laughs> that pass away and you see the estate sales and you might see this in any neighborhood and estate sale pops up. And sometimes there are companies that come in and they handle an estate sale. That is something different than what you do, isn't it? So the people who are like separating out, this is the throwaway pile. This is the donate pile. This is the sell pile. Right. At what point do you become involved? Is it, I mean, what are some indicators or some tells and how can you help someone who might be watching this to say, gee, should I reach out to you? Should I reach out to the, you know, the person who's selling the stuff in the house? Right. So anytime you're doing something that involves filing with the IRS or making an official donation, it's good to bring in a qualified appraiser, a qualified according to IRS standards and, you know, just with an accrediting organization behind them. You know, we're producing basically a legal document versus, you know, someone just giving you an opinion of what they think they could sell something for. Um, it's just a different, you know, more weight to what we're providing in terms of, you know, support for the report. Right. And initially what we can do is just do a walkthrough. You know, mm -hmm. we'll make an appointment and do a walkthrough and help categorize things. Mm -hmm. These can go for an estate sale. These require a more formal appraisal because they're higher value. Generally, we tell people if something is valued more than $5,000, it warrants a formal appraisal. Otherwise, it's not worthwhile. And they can probably just sell it through an estate sale or donate. Now, if you, I happen to have a... Uh... <laughs> A collection of guitars that uh, my son played uh, and I played uh, when he was growing up and they do have value and those are probably an appraisal item. So if these are vintage musical instruments, I would say that's something you could put into your estate plan, but you do that by an assignment to specifically a a answer your question. But you know, some of these guitars are very valuable. Some have, um, you know, it's not uncommon for a guitar to be 10,000 or 20,000. Um, and so I think it's something you would in include in your trust by that assignment and something that probably should be valued if you're not specifically giving those. So in my estate plan, my son came to me and he said, dad, please make sure I get the guitars. Well, if it's a specific gift, you may have an appraisal to figure out, you know, if there's, if it's a taxable estate, but if, if those instruments are going to an individual, then those instruments don't necessarily have to be valued for distribution purposes because they're getting the thing anyway. Right. But you might need to value those for estate purposes. Yeah. I, I remember meeting with, um, I can't give too, inf too much information because it's a famous person, but they, <laughs> this person was pointing at paintings and saying, I paid 30,000 for this, 30,000 for that one, 35 for that one, 40 for that one, 48. I think the paintings were each worth over a hundred, 
but mm-hmm. people, you're, yeah, you're right. Yeah. People remember what they paid for. What you paid for it is a starting point. That's maybe that's right. your basis, right? But it's not necessarily what, what it's valued at. Exactly. So let's talk about reasons for appraisal. What are yeah. some reasons for that you get an appraisal? Uh, a lot of people ask me as a lawyer, should I have these appraised? And, you know, uh, lawyers, look, we're not trained in this stuff. Okay. But let's talk about reasons for appraisal. I think the first one's insurance coverage and damage or, or loss claims. Walk us, walk us through that. Right. So the purpose of having the reason to have an appraisal for insurance, number one is protection, right? It's protection so that you can be made whole if there's a loss. And so that's, that's number one, because if it's not scheduled and depending, I always tell people check with your insurance policy first and make sure what is automatically covered under your blanket policy and what needs to be scheduled separately. Those are the most important things. And just because things were appraised five, 10, 15 years ago, doesn't mean that they're appraised for current value. So you want these things to be current. You want them to be within the last three to five years. So we've had situations where people tell us, oh, I don't believe in insurance. You know, I don't care. I, my kids don't care about this art collection. It was mine and my husband's. And if it goes up in flames, I really don't care. Well, guess what? It, it They do care. The moment that that house goes up in flames and they lose their precious art collection, I've been told by many, that was the thing that hurt the most when they lost. Because, yeah. you know, an art collection and even, you know, these, these personal things that you have in your home, their statements about yourself and a relationship yeah. with your family, a relationship that you've had with your, with your ancestors who've low, you know, in here, uh, sent things down to you through the generations and they mean something. I mean, when you see them lost forever, it, it hurts. And so the appraisals for insurance really are to make people whole again and for protection. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's a record of what you have in case something does happen. You have exactly. everything in the appraisal report, what it was, you know, exactly identified. And so it just takes a lot of the trouble after the fact of trying to recreate what was in your collection from family photographs or, you know, just ephemera. <laughs> Yeah. So when, when people pass away, things uh, might have to be valued for estate and gift tax or estate taxes also for probate. So California, if you do go through probate, there's the California probate referee, they will ascribe values to assets, uh, personal property. I will just say from personal experience, a lot of times you'll see a line item, you know, personal property, 5,000 personal property, 10,000. This is on a non-taxable estate. You know, if it's somebody's junk, you know, you know, nobody cares, but if it's artwork, if it's valuable, if, you know, these decorative arts, as we've kind of discussed, it's very important that if you have a taxable estate now, right now, a taxable estate is an estate over twelve million nine hundred twenty thousand dollars. So that's a large number. If right. you're filing a death tax return, a seven hundred six, and it's a fifteen million dollar estate, and you list the personal property at a thousand dollars, I think that's a problem. And because yep. people who have a fifteen million dollar estate don't have a thousand dollars in personal property, mm-hmm. they have they have other stuff. So, uh, exactly. and these are um, are written appraisals that are attached to these particular forms. So whether it's your gift tax return, which is a form seven hundred nine or the 706, which is the death tax return or the probate inventory and appraisal. So estate planning, um, this is really important. So this is also part of your estate plan should cover your personal property. And we had a question earlier about, hey, I have this uh, collection of, of guitars. That may be a significant portion of the value of your estate or not. It can also be the source of conflict in your estate. So I mentioned we're on the cusp of, of Thanksgiving. And a lot of people, those families never get together again for Thanksgiving because of some fight. And as you were talking, Andrea, I was, I was thinking that my father-in-law recently passed away a few days ago, actually, after a long battle of with with Alzheimer's and dementia. And for him, tangible items were very important. And then I was reading an article that for many people, that's how they remember things. So, you know, when they discover these, um, you know, people who lived 25 or 30,000 years ago, and they'll find these little... Uh, almost little carvings, right, that are with these people. This is very important. This is like a very human thing to do is to have tangible property. And it can really drive a lot of memory for people. So not only the person who has it, but also, you know, when you leave this earth and these things that you've had, that you've possessed, that your family has seen you with, that can be the tangible, um, you know, that's almost like a tangible manifestation of you when when you leave this earth. So very powerful. These these t- items of tangible property can be very, very uh, powerful and meaningful. Let's talk about charitable contribution. So l- let's say I have a painting. I paid 100000 for it and it's worth a million and I want to sell it and I want to help out a charity. I think I need an appraisal, don't I? Right, Absolutely. definitely. 
you need an appraisal for anything over $5,000 that you have donated, and particularly for anything over $20,000 that you've donated. That's an yes. IRS requirement. Um, you know, I wanted to, to, to say one thing, though, about the estate planning purpose, and that yep. is that um, many times, as yes. we said before, people don't know what they're getting. And they don't know about the responsibility associated with ownership, right? Because if you have an expensive painting, are you well equipped to store it if you need to? Are you well equipped to insure it if you need to? There are certain expenses that go along with that. And so beneficiaries need to know. So that kind of dissemination of information, once you know what something is worth, it goes a long way to preparing your, you know, preparing your beneficiaries for the future. So it's just knowing ahead of time rather than after the fact, right? Yeah. It allows for proper planning. So we have a we have a quick question here. I think this is relevant. If my sister got a $20,000 guitar and I didn't get more cash, that wouldn't be fair. Yeah. Right, that's where equitable distribution comes in. And that's, even if it's, you know, a variety of items, maybe some have value, some don't, if they're all valued, then you can be like, well, I'll take these five mid-range value things and you take this one very expensive thing, you know, if some way to make it equitable. It's, you understand, you know, all the pieces can, you know, be kind of talked about more objectively that way because they're, they're each so you have a dollar amount associated with them. Yeah. And if, and if you have valuable things, if the trust says split at 50, 50 and somebody gets a $25,000 guitar, that other person should get 25,000 in cash or 25,000 in items. So okay. that is a reason to have an appraisal is yes. for a division of property. Now, do you appraise that at market value? Do you appraise it at replacement value? Well, market fair market value. value. Fair market, fair market value. value. Yeah. Okay. Always, yeah. Right. Always fair market. Because the assumption with the estate is should you have to dissolve the estate, what are you going to get for it? Right. Replacement yeah. value right. is to actually buy something equivalent. So yes. when it, we talk about estates, it's always about fair market value for sure. Replacement now, value is including all sorts of retail markups that you may have to pay yeah. if you have to go out to the store and buy it that don't really come into play. And it's this sort of situation. So for our purposes here, divorce. Um, I want to talk about if somebody inherits a valuable painting and there's a divorce, you can have that valuable painting held in a continuing trust, okay? You can have that valuable painting held in a continuing trust to continue to protect it from a divorcing spouse. So property, all the property acquired during marriage is, is considered community property, except property acquired by divorce, except property acquired by gift or inheritance. But you can acquire property by gift or inheritance and later tell your spouse, oh, honey, this is really community property. Now, proving it's a different question, but this is a very important issue because if somebody does inherit a substantial value of, of tangible assets, you may want to protect those, right? You may want to protect those from a divorcing spouse. And when that property is split 50-50, a judge needs to determine what's community, what's separate, because community gets split 50-50 absent a prenuptial agreement. So very, very important um, disillusion. We're not divorce attorneys. And then bankruptcy, we're kind of the opposite of bankruptcy. <laughs> but um, how? what are valuation? How does a bankruptcy court value these assets? Is it fair market value? It's a uh, liquidation value. It's slightly yeah. different. And there are two types of liquidation mm -hmm. values. There's forced liquidation and orderly liquidation, right? So forced meaning we got to sell it tomorrow. So those values are going to be significantly lower than if you had an a orderly liquidation, which you have time to put these things out into the proper market and determine, you know, what is the best market for these to get the most out of, right? So um, so those, you know, I have to say we we don't encounter very much of those ourselves. Um, but it's it's all about market level and speed, you know, the degree to which you have some time to to put it in the proper marketplace. So WeWork just filed for uh, bankruptcy. So if they had a bunch of art, and I don't know that they do, but if they did, that would be valued at that forced liquidation uh, value. Or That's right. right, yeah. So and different potential buyers are going to get a good deal, right? They should be yeah. there. <laughs> right. just get in line, right? Yeah. Um, let's let's talk about collateral. Um, so collateral valuations, meaning getting a loan so pledging a piece of art or a collectible as collateral right well my one question is where does that art go but sec just walk me through this using using art as collateral i mean i'm, I'm assuming this is not a pawn shop or you're not like pawning a piece of right no 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 art, so typically right? what people will do is they'll have an expensive work of art and they that might be cash poor 
-hmm. they want to diversify their investments and they want to buy a piece of property. They want to buy a boat. So they will use their artwork as collateral for another investment type. And then they need an appraisal for that. So uh, another case that we saw was a situation, it, this was a divorce case that involved a collateral valuation where the husband got an expensive painting but needed to pay his wife a certain amount. And so he used the painting as collateral to get cash out of the artwork and pay the wife. So there are a lot of very creative ways of manipulating these investments that people have and, and using money for other purposes, yeah. So do you get, do you, if, if you borrow, let's say you have a painting and you borrow against it, does the painting stay with you or does it go to yes. the, okay. Yes. All right. It does in most cases. Yes. Yeah. Um, artists estates. So we do in our law firm, our practice, we do have artists as clients. And mm -hmm. so not, not too often, but we do have them and just walk me through what, um, you know, this would be an example where you have an artist who passes away with an inventory of art, right? Yep. Right. How, how does so that this, work? This can be complicated um, because, as you know, when we do the estate appraisal, it's going to be effective as of the date of death. So what would these pieces be worth on that date? But if you release hundreds of artwork into the market on one day, of course, the prices are going to go down, just supply and demand. So we apply what's called a blockage discount when there's you know, a huge amount of very similar pieces coming on the market at the same time, we'll, we'll have to discount the fair market values to account for those market conditions. So that's one factor to keep in mind when doing a large estate belonging to an artist. Yeah, I had, uh, I, I grew up in Ojai in a, a kind of an mm -hmm. art community and mm -hmm. a couple doors up was a very famous uh, photographer who passed away, passed away and his son continues with this catalog to to continue to make prints from negatives and so it's this ongoing business so for many artists that continues on after um after they pass away and and rex ray was another kind of well-known artist in the san francisco bay area we've got some of his works and his his legacy continued on so this is a thing if you're an artist or know an artist or you've got a relative uh, many times these do sort of continue on after the artist passes away Wait, so yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say they absolutely do, even before the artist passes away, right. because artists are notoriously bad business people, <laughs> and they don't really? often. <laughs> yeah, and they don't often keep good records. I mean, we walk into artists' estate. We have a lot of experience in working with artists' mm -hmm. estate, and typically they will just have everything on a paper ledger, not even knowing if they ever got paid for the sale that a dealer might have made. And so, one of the you know advantages of what we can do for them is inventory the collection on a cloud-based database so they have a record of absolutely everything and they can track what gallery has it how much did it sell for was it ever shipped out you know all of that and it just makes their life so much easier and the life of their studio executives so much easier right. to keep track of. and then when they pass we've got the data and then we can start the valuation much faster yeah, sh shocking level of disorganization. I, I'm, I'm uh, chuckling because I just, there was an open uh, artist weekend thing in San Francisco a few weekends ago, and we bought some art and it's completely informal. No, there's no, no normal business processes involved at all, but anyway. <laughs> so how to prepare for an appraisal. So you are, you are going to get this appraisal done of this property. Like what, what do you need to do? Maybe you're an executor or trustee of an estate. Maybe these are your assets. Maybe you're, you know, trying to split up some type of collection. How do you prepare for an appraisal? What, what's the process? What walk us through that? Yeah. Well, the very first thing we really like for people to have is some sort of an inventory and it can be really informal. And again, mm -hmm. we, we see people from a huge range, right? Some are extremely organized and have actual databases and spreadsheets and other people have no idea. So we're mm -hmm. able to help them on all those levels. We can do the inventory for them, but if they have some sort of list that that's very helpful. And that could be, like I said, very simple, a spreadsheet or a database, even if they just have photographs, if they have mm -hmm. videos, um, if they have some thing. And they should yes. always keep their purchase receipts and have their documents. Um, that's very, very helpful. It gives us a good starting point and it gives good information for history of ownership. Are there any sort of, um, so people have paintings, is it good to print out like a bio of, of the artist or somehow leave that with the painting or, or, or not? Or, cause I know what, what started, by the way, just to give everyone, if you're watching this, what gave some background, I got connected with you. I can't even remember how 
and I have a painting and I didn't know who the artist was. And you immediately identified who the artist was. And it was a Bay Area type artist. And it was like, wow, that's really impressive. I mean, you know what you're doing. Um, and that's why, you're, that's why you're here and we're talking to you. Uh, but it, does that make sense uh, to have some narrative or some other type of uh, description? I mean, what, what are best practices that people can do? The more information, the better, you know, <laughs> Always. the more information, the better. The best practice really is if you buy something, scan the invoice, save it on the cloud somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's number one. If you can photocopy it and put it on the back of the painting, that's great too. But if the house goes, you know, up in flames, you're going to lose the painting and you're going to lose the documentation. Mm -hmm. so saving your documentation on some sort of cloud-based server is ideal. Mm -hmm. You know, and and we're going to talk about beneficiary uh, discussions. And a beneficiary is a person who gets something. So like if I die and I leave it to my three kids, my three kids are going to get my stuff. All right. These are really okay. important questions. This may be very important to you if it's your stuff. And okay. when your kids inherit this, they may be like, we don't want this stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, and then agreement. I, I mean, do you have any creative ways to resolve a disagreement? I mean, or are, are you the appraiser and you're like, well, I don't know. You guys figure it out. I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, it's, that's every family is different, you know, and you, some people need someone to kind of referee their division of assets, you know, to walk through them with the appraisal. And, you know, some people can just talk it through, um, you know, that's going to just vary by family, I think, and beneficiaries, but having all the information ahead of time, you know, or having these discussions before, the loss happens, you know, while everyone's still alive is probably kind of good to forestall this from happening, these disagreements from happening. If it's the more you talk about it, the better, probably. Yeah. I, you know what? I, I think it may depend on the case. I, I remember years ago, I had this client who had the, um, a big, like the biggest collection in the world of something. And again, I'm not going to be too specific because you people would figure out who it was. And, and he, he's like, Jim, what do I do? I said, well, talk to, you know, who wants it. And then he came back years later. He's like, Jim, that was the worst advice ever. I should have never talked about who wanted my collection. So I would say you need to figure that out for yourself. But if it's, you know, if it's a painting, you know, who wants this painting, if that starts a fight, uh, you know, you may not want to, you, you may want to delay that fight. Um, but again, I think it's, it's case specific. Well, it is case specific and, you know, we're really good because we will, because we are independent third parties, we come oh in you know, with a whole different pair of eyes and objectives, right? We, we're just there to give information and we can help guide them, you know, through that. And I think by, by not being, not having a stake in it, we can give a lot of really good advice. And sometimes it makes sense to just get it out of the estate. You know, if you're fighting over right. it, let's get it out of the estate. Do, yeah. we, need to it? Do we need to donate it? Yeah. And there's, there's um, a company called fair split. And I think we've had them on a, a webinar in the past and it's actually software where you can go in and it's used a lot in divorce cases where people there's one thing and then essentially it ranks it's fair split.com, but it ranks all of the um, uh, items and there's hmm. some values in there, but then you have points and then it's, it's kind of an auction system. So it's actually a way using electronics to, or, or, you know, using, using tech to solve for that problem and, and hopefully avoid the conflict. So what needs to be appraised? What sort of things um, need to be appraised and, and what's, what are the reporting requirements? Let's just kind of, kind of look at that. You've got your form 8283, which is the uh, non-cash non charitable contribution form. You probably do this a lot, but walk us through the appraisal process. Well, so we will do a walkthrough um, initially and and help them decide what needs to be appraised. This for this form eighty two eighty three is is just specif specified for um, for the donation appraisal, but in turn and so what needs to be appraised is like we said before anything over five thousand dollars that they're going to donate and certainly anything over twenty thousand dollars which needs the actual appraisal that needs mm -hmm. to have comps and it's a it's a much more complete document but um we're very good about going through the house with our clients and making those decisions and those decisions really have to do with what do they intend to keep what do they not really care about what has some significant value over five thousand dollars and you know what is worth spending the money and time to get it appraised so their conversations are very very specific to each situations and you know we've had a lot of experience with you know in, in discussing this with them <clears throat> and then gifting if i give something to a charity do they typically turn around and sell it right away what what actually happens well they usually have to hang on to it the charity does um for two years i believe of after the donation um or else they have to file 
another, it's not 8284 form, I believe it is. Um, so you want to make sure that the benefit or the, the dummy organization realizes that they do need to hang on to the item. So there are a lot of things that you can appraise and getting ready for this. I went to um, that um, Antiques Roadshow, you know, it's on PBS. I actually like watching that show because it's all this random stuff that pops up. One of the most valuable things on Antiques Roadshow was a pair of socks that someone from the Red Sox wore. <laughs> they were called the Red Stockings. It was like one of their top ones. And there, are, there's a lot of uh, East Asian art. So they had some um, rhino horn cups that are like, I don't know, hundreds of years old and some bowl that's 900 years old. How do you, like, how do you even figure out what this stuff is? Like, I mean, on the decorative arts, how do you even know? Well, it can be tricky. I mean, and a lot of times you'll be looking at something and like, oh, this is just junk. And then you do your research and find out, no, it's actually not, or it's actually a particular niche collecting area that a small group of people just is wild about. Um, so it can really vary. And there's um, a lot of good specialists out there that are, you know, have their particular little area that we've had relationships with. So that's helpful too. Well, so what are things our instinct, you, yeah, I'm our instinct, no, just it's our instinct and experience, you know, yeah. and knowing when when to keep going, you know, versus stopping, mm -hmm. right? That's mm -hmm. I, I've had situations where I walked into a family home in Palo Alto and they showed me these three paintings that I didn't think very much of at all. And they were hiding under the bed. <clears throat> um, and the rest of the estate was just kind of modest, nice things, nothing special. So I immediately profiled them. You know, I thought, oh, you know, these things are going to be moderate. And as I started to do my research, long story short, each one of those three paintings was worth between 1.3 million and 1.9 million each. <laughs> and I would have never thought it had I stopped that. <laughs> and, and, and used my own, you know, subjective opinion about it. And so that, you know, it's a great example of how we, we got to know when not to stop you know, and we have to know who the experts are. And one little piece of information led me to another piece of information, led me to another dealer, led me to another dealer. And, and on it went until I discovered that this artist was hugely important and it changed the profile of this family's estate. You know, can you imagine wow. three paintings of that value? And they had no idea. Wow. And, and, and a lot of times this is something that somebody didn't buy but it might've been gifted or they might've known the exactly. artist. And so there's a lot of times there's a story behind it. So I would, I would think that, you know, if, if, if you're thinking about your parents or grandparents or something and you go, Oh, they knew this artist and they have stuff from them. That's probably an indicator that you should pay attention to it. Right. Um, I mean, not every artist is going to to paint a painting that's worth a million and a half dollars, but I think a lot of them have, right. I mean, it's not, not uncommon. So uh, Amy asks, do you find that when you appraise art that the value does actually go up over the years? How often should you have the art appraised for insurance purposes? Interesting. For insurance, we generally recommend every three to five years just to have an assessment. It doesn't necessarily have to be appraisal. And we offer the service as a complimentary, you know, service to our clients. Let's just take a look at your schedule and let's look at your, your collection and let's see if it makes sense to reappraise it. So three to five years is a good rule of thumb. Okay. Not everything goes up in value. Many things go down in value. It totally depends on the artist and the market. So handbags. Um <laughs> I think some, anyway, my wife at, at one point was really into bags. I think less so. I think, I don't know if it's, you know, maybe a stage in life, but uh, handbags, let's talk about that. Hand, handbags, huge, huge market for handbags. I yeah. mean, you know that for $400,000, you could buy a Hermes Birka, Birkin handbag, or, or you can buy a home in certain parts of the country, mm -hmm. or you can buy a 1992 Lamborghini. I mean, imagine that for $400,000, you can buy a bag. <laughs> it's, it's really, it, it's something, and this is on the secondary market. Uh, we had a situation where we appraised um, a, a client's art and antiques. And as we're walking out the door, the woman says to me, you know, my mother just passed on to me a bunch of designer handbags. I have three boys. I don't care about it. I, I, I'm not a fancy dresser. What do I do with this stuff? And I said, well, let me see it. So I walked into her closet, which was as big as my bedroom. And she had custom shelves made for these incredibly beautiful 
designer handbags, some vintage, some with the tag still on. We inventoried them and we appraised them and they were close to a million dollars. She had no idea. Wow. And so what was she going to do with this? So, you know, we, we put her in touch with certain vendors that ate them up. They just loved them. But the point here is that it's important to, for all of you who work in the estate planning business <laughs> is to ask the question, what do you spend your money on? Yeah. Because that's a nice broader question rather than, are you an art collector? Are you an antiques collector? What do you spend your money on? Because you're going to find all sorts of random things popping up that um, you would not imagine are actually quite valuable. You know, uh, celebrity memorabilia. There's, yes. there's a huge market for that. And you have a couple of those things. It could be in the millions of dollars very easily. And they had no idea because I just ran into a situation where um, somebody had a soccer jersey from 1977. It was an Italian um, tournament worn soccer jersey and it sold for $15,000 at auction a couple months ago. He had no idea. His beneficiaries had no idea. They, they just thought, oh, dad, you know, he loves soccer. I don't care about soccer. He's got this jersey. It's kind of dirty and dingy. $15,000. Wow. So, you know, asking those questions, what do you spend your money on? What are your interests? What are your hobbies can bring out a lot of things in people's lives that could make a very big difference in the asset class. Right. You know, it's funny. You're talking about the, um, the soccer Jersey or, you know, football Jersey. Um, my, when my father, I mentioned my father-in-law passed away, he had these two Hawaiian shirts that are like antique Hawaiian shirts that he wore all the time. That's something that's, you know, who knows? I mean, that's yeah. that's a collectible, right? Yeah. Yeah, the vintage hand blocked. I mean, there's there's definitely a collector's market for that. Uh, Cynthia asks, what about antique pianos with ivory keys? I think that's the hundred year rule, right? So if it's nineteen twenty three mm -hmm. or earlier. Yeah, um, it's. Uh, I don't know if it's a hundred years from when the treaty, the Endangered Species oh. Act, was passed, or a hundred years like from today. That's uh, something to be checked on, but. Yeah, you know, it's definitely a factor like to be considered in any ivory situation. You kind of have to think about that. All right. So let's talk about um, appraisals and there are different types of value for different purposes. And so this is where we get into replacement value for insurance and fair market value for estate planning. Fair market value is what a willing buyer and a willing seller without any under any pressure or compunction would would arrive at at a price. Why is how is replacement value different than fair market value? Isn't it the same? Maybe explain why it's not the same. Yeah, so they're 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 totally different. So replacement value, the idea here is should you should something happen to your artwork, your furniture, your car, whatever it is, and you need to replace it, you need to go usually into the retail market and replace it with something comparable. So that's usually a retail market level, right? Where do I get something similar? Fair market value for estate planning, the IRS wants to know. If you were to dissolve the estate, what would you actually get for it? And this is a market in which the most knowledgeable players in the marketplace transact. So you think of it that way. So many times that's a secondary market. And in some common cases, market. market, the most common market where these things trade, yes, where and the most players are most active in. So that's usually secondary market. So if I buy um you know, a painting by Andy Warhol from a gallery in downtown San Francisco, I'm going to pay maybe, you know, if it's a print, I might pay $100,000 for it. If I try to then put it in my estate, and then we need to know, you know, what this might be able to be sold for on the open market, you know, that might be significantly less. It might be only $50,000, might be $60,000. So there's usually a difference, but it depends. You know, again, my, the answer, most common answer is it depends, but that's that's sort of in a nutshell, wholesale versus retail. You can think of it that way too. So how do you assess market data? So if you're talking about what things are actually trading for on the, on the fair market value, how is this reported? How is it reported? I think there are probably more appraisals than there are sales, if I had to guess, right? Just- um. Well, there's a lot of sales, like that's our okay. sales are our data. So yeah. we are looking at, we find the correct market level for the value that we're choosing, fair market value. In most cases will be the auction market. As Andrea said, it does depend. Um, so let's say it's the auction market. We're looking at, we're amassing a, a array of sales that are comparable of pieces to what we're appraising. So they are similar in terms of size, uh, artists, style, you know, a number of factors. And um, 
we look at how our piece fits into that data and you know using our experience and our kind of knowledge of the market we look at how our piece compares to what others are selling for and that's how the value is concluded and then um <laughs> provenance what that's explain important. what provenance if, explain what that is and why it's important well, provenance Problem. is a history yeah, of the ownership. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's ahead. a his history of ownership, basically. Where has the piece been? And this can be helpful or it, this can hurt the value. Like, did it belong to a really famous person? Did it belong to Jackie Kennedy? You know, that's going to raise the value, say. then. But did it, you know, is the provenance missing? Is there a gap in provenance in, say, the 1930s, 1940s and the pieces from Europe? That's a red flag. Was the piece, you know, stolen from a family during World War II? You know, that's a restitution question. So provenance can be invaluable in, like, adding to um, a value or it can really hurt a value if there's a problem with it. How often do, does the the sort of items that were stolen during World War II, is that something that pops up frequently in, in your world, infrequently? What's, I mean, how much of a red flag is this for people who are collecting? It's it's moderately frequent, moderately yeah. frequent. I mean, in, in particular, it happens with um, old master paintings, usually, mm -hmm. uh, things that are a little bit older, um, 19th century and, and, and older. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, it's, it's, it's definitely an issue because something that somebody discovered the provenance on later after it was purchased by a collector can impact its ability to be sold. Right. You know, so somebody in good faith buys it and spends, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on an old master painting. And then when he turns around to sell it, there's been new provenance that has arisen since then. And now, you know, there was a gap in ownership or it was owned by, you know, a Nazi war criminal or something like that. And the assumption is that it was stolen. So now, you know, there has no value. So it's it's a very important piece. So when you say it has no value, what happens to it? Do people, does it go back to the original owner? What If they what can't, if the original owners come to, to ah. make a claim of some sort, then yes. But, but many times the, the buyer is just stuck with it. And there's no, and people just don't touch that in the art world. They're just, and people don't touch okay. it. They All do right. not touch it. Yeah. Let's look at art and antiques market trends. So uh, past five years, let's talk about where, where is the market? Well, the pandemic was very good for the art market. <laughs> Sur surprisingly or not, um, it was, you know, that online platform, people's inability to go out to auction markets. I think people worried about that, but the um, auction houses did a very, very good job of bringing sales online and making it available to a much wider audience. People who would otherwise be intimidated to go into an art gallery, they were willing to buy and sell online. And so the market in 2020 through 2022 was reached some incredible highs. Um, Luxury goods in particular, uh, collectibles in particular. You've heard stories about the Michael Jordan sneakers that sold for $300,000, you know, just crazy, crazy sales. Um, and then, of course, you have your standards, you know, that are always doing well, you know, Picasso and Warhol and Basquiat, you know, they they just they do well no matter what. Um, however, in 2023, now we're seeing we're just going through the New York art auctions last week and this week, and there's been a little bit of, uh, of jitters, let's say, among collectors. So things are kind of returning, maybe there's a little bit of a correction happening. It's not that things aren't selling, but they're not selling with the fever that they were selling in the last couple of years, at least in the fine art market. Yeah, so why do, why do people pay? I mean, without getting into, because we talk, when we're getting ready for this, we talked about Jackson Pollock and sort of the American art movement, but why do people pay $50 million for a painting or, or 10 million or a hundred million? Uh, obviously it brings them more joy than the money that it costs them. But what, what are some of the reasons that people pay a large sum of money for art? It's, it's hard to put your hands around your, your mm -hmm. whole, it's hard to grasp our minds around yeah. $134 million Picasso sale that happened last week, $134 million. Yeah. Even if you're a billionaire, that's still a lot of money. Yeah, I mean, cause is. you're not, you're not getting 5% on CDs or whatever. I mean, when you look at this, just from a, an economic math standpoint, um, so why yeah. do people spend that kind of money on art? 
Yeah. I think there's a lot of reasons. I think there's um, true art lovers, true art historians who see the significance of these artifacts, that they have a role in our society, you know, and they are a, a representation of a specific place and time, you know, and they are, you know, I think that that's, they they are artifacts, you know, and they're representative of modern art. They're representative of, you know, the, the the transformation in the art world. On the other hand, some people buy it because they want to compete and they want to say that they owned it. And they want to, there's a lot Peacocking. of stuff. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> because their neighbor down the street, you know, just bought a Warhol for 50 million. So now they need to buy it for 51 million because they can't. <laughs> so there is a little bit of that competition, you know, absolutely. So there's a lot lot of you know what drives people is it's it's hard to you know frame in, in a sentence but it's complicated <laughs> um we have a question tied in as we kind of come to we're we're kind of coming around the, the the bend here to to wrap it up and the question is as a category is antique european furniture from the early 20th century generally less collectible coveted than it was perhaps a generation ago well, it really depends on the style. I mean, early 20th century, like we're getting into Art Deco, Art Nouveau, um, you know, heading towards the what we call the mid-century now. So, um, you know, it's in general, these sort of historical styles, so historical revivals of 18th century, 17th century looks, you know, what we kind of, what something is kind of casually called brown furniture um sometimes if they're replicas of like this older style then they they do tend to be that market is a little soft right now there's just a lot of supply from people who are kind of deaccessioning their collections right. not a lot of demand from collectors these days but you know as we've seen um some things from that time period are selling really well if there are these styles that are pe what people are collecting nowadays so anonymous asks, are Hummel statues valued? What are, are are they valued? Hummel, you know. Well, you know, they, everything has a value. So, yeah. <laughs> but, um, it depends again on the situation. You know, for replacement value, fair yeah. market value, rarity. There's so many factors. Um, contemporary art. What's hot in contemporary art, and what's not? In contemporary art, you know, um, works by people of color, artists of color, are very popular. Women artists are very popular. The figure is coming back. Um, ah. Abstraction is is still obviously very very of interest to collectors. But I'm noticing that a lot of people are looking at the at figuration again and um, paintings and images that have to do with the concept of identity. Mm -hmm. um, as we all kind of figure out where we belong in this world, um, people are doing a lot of of a visual commentary on that. So I would say that that's, that's what's really um, of interest to the ultra contemporary market, meaning art is born from 1974 to the present um, was absolutely going crazy in the last couple of years. And now it's kind of slowed down just a little bit. Uh, but I would say, you know, look, if, if somebody is interested in buying art, look for art by female artists and look for artists of color and look for, um, you know, anything that inspires you really, it should be personal. It should be something that right. you love. Don't worry about what's hot, buy what you like. Yeah, I'm reminded just before COVID, um, kind of that that winter before COVID hit in in uh, 2019, I, there were fires in Malibu in in the fall, and I was down in in um, Santa Monica having dinner with a friend, and his friend showed up, and he said my house just burned down in Malibu, and I had to go buy these clothes, and he had been collecting art for 25 years. And he said, I don't care about the house, I can rebuild it, but the art that's gone is irreplaceable. Now, yeah. yes, it's insured, but you're never going to replace it. Right. I mean, that's just it's just tragedy. So uh, Marissa asked, maybe please have a link to the slides and the recording. Marissa, this will be on YouTube at the end of the day today at 6 p.m. So um, and I think, Ashley, don't we send out a, a link to everyone who attended uh, the YouTube link? I believe we do. So we should be getting that in your in your email. Uh, Mid-century modern art and design. That seems to be kind of on, um, you know, that's kind of hot now. Right. Yeah, it's been having a moment for for a few years now. Yeah. Um, you know, people seem to, especially again, if it has a known designer, um, that's really makes it a big difference in value. If you can, you know, trace the piece to a certain individual or firm that was designing back then, the more information and paperwork you have, particularly with mid century, the better. Uh, Anonymous asks, uh, are nineteen sixties original oil paintings from the Philippines collectible? 
it really depends on the artist and yeah. who made them. I'd say reach out. And if it's something that you think, uh, you know, there, if, if you're not sure if there's any there there, then uh, reach out and and ask him. Uh, let's uh, formal formal entertaining services. We we talked about this when we were getting ready for it. Um, the you know the twenty place servings are where are these at? Grandma's China. You know there, it's it's just people don't dine the way they yeah. used to. You know people aren't having big formal you know parties and things. That being said, you know if you have a sterling silver flatware service, a service for 12, that's going to have some value, particularly if it's a well-known maker, well-regarded maker. China services, again, they, there's a huge difference here. We're talking about replacement value for insurance, fair market value for estate. There's a huge difference here. So if you're, you probably would want to insure your China because it's expensive to go to Bloomingdale's or wherever to replace it. But, you know, for estate purposes, that's not what we're going to be looking at to determine the value. All right. So we're in California. We're in the ring of fire, right? That whole like ring of mountains and earthquakes from North and South America and, and Asia. Um, big earthquake hits, knocks over the China cabinet, destroys all the China. Is that covered by homeowners or not? Or do I have to get a separate earthquake policy for that? Or do you know? Oh, um, I think you have for earthquakes, I think you do need an earthquake policy, oh. but I have a feeling that if they're covered under a blanket policy, um, or I, I shouldn't have, actually, I shouldn't give advice about it. Yeah, huh? I know. I, I think this is actually I'm really interesting because, sure. you know, think those type of things fall over in an earthquake and just yeah, can, yeah. smash everything. And if that's you, you, that might not work more. The reason I ask is that very well might not even be covered by your homeowners because it's I think for earthquake. You're right. Yeah. 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 It's probably good to speak to your rep, your representative about schedules and like what needs yeah. to be scheduled versus yeah, what can be covered under the blanket. So when we were getting ready for this, there's a there's a picture if you're watching this of a of a painting that's kind of you know looks damaged and then um, then redone and and this might have been put in plastic. What what about wrapping things in plastic? Is that a good idea or a terrible idea? Terrible, terrible, terrible idea. Never wrap anything in plastic. Okay. Uh, plastic will it, it's sticky, right? And with mm -hmm. humidity and heat um, in a home, uh, it will stick to the canvas. It will stick to the oil paint. It will stick to the silver, and it's a it's it's a restorer's nightmare. So never wrap anything. If you're going to wrap anything, wrap it with a with a blanket. That's usually the best thing to do. Not a plastic blanket, but a blanket. Not a plastic blanket. <laughs> no, a cotton blanket. <laughs> um, so sales and negotiation, you uh, you are very experienced in this. So if you've got, if I would say if you're watching this or listening to it and you're like, gosh, this is me, we've got this stuff, reach out to um, um, reach out to Andrea and, and uh, Lisa because they're going to give you an unbiased view. So you're not a commission-based thing. It's like, oh, come to us and we'll sell it and take a commission. That's a different structure. And we'll have um, some information on how to contact you here in just a couple of slides. And it also is in, in the links. This brings us to the end of our content. We our, our firm has offices in Northern and Southern California. Your offices are located in the Bay Area, Northern California, and you service clients all over the United States. So you're based in the Bay Area. And here's your uh, contact information, rothartgroup.com and 925-299-6850. If you're watching this on YouTube, please don't forget to uh, hit subscribe. And we'll, uh, we have a couple more minutes here to answer some questions. And um, the link here is in the notes. It will also be in the um, uh, the link if you're watching this on YouTube. You can click that. So I want to thank you, um, Andrea and Lisa, for joining us here today and, and spending some time with us. And if you're watching this on YouTube, just keep watching. Don't turn it off because it's magically going to roll to another video.